of our programs, whether it's the Pop Culture Cosmos, PCC Multiverse, or whatever shows up on the Pop Culture Cosmos channel and Inside Sports. We truly appreciate you taking the time to do so. We're talking NBA today, and I just tell you what, it's going to be a great time indeed because the season is over, but the fun for NBA is just about to begin. It is not only the time for draft and the NBA draft, but also for the NBA free agency season coming right around the corner. And who better to talk about the NBA than our man in the know when it comes to the round ball action? It's our good friend, Anthony Barberin. Man, it's so great to talk to you. I haven't talked to you in a little while. I was thinking about getting together uh, you know, for a talk and interview about the playoffs. But then again, we pretty much talked about the playoffs and it went straight as what we expected so we really wasn't much to talk about was there right um yeah i mean it shook it shook out the way we thought it was gonna shake out uh lebron being the best in the game dragging who he drug to the nba finals but you know you put three of the two of the best shooters the game has ever seen arguably three if you want to you know one of the best scorers one of the best players in the league all on the same team um it, it, it's uh had he done that man it, w- it would have been spectacular but it it was pretty much uh unfeasible for him to to accomplish that feat so i was yeah. just put it this way whenever i have that picture of lebron now i just see lebron you know if the superman and all that ty- type of deal but with that cape with the, with a cape with everybody just like hanging on to it you, yeah, know? Right. Just, you know him just like okay i'm gonna take you i'm gonna take you as far as i can go and it, this was uh, no less the case when it came to the NBA Finals. But the season's over, my friend. But the fun is just now beginning. The NBA Draft is literally for us, as we're taping this, right around the corner. It's coming up on Thursday. There's a lot to choose from and a lot of talk and a lot of conversations. I'll ask you this. I asked you a little bit before well, well, you know, before we started recording. But I want to ask you now, did you want to go about it as far as our first the top 15 picks, did you want to go about it what we would choose or what you think they're going to choose at those selections, provided there's no trades, which we all know will mess everything up and we know will probably happen? We It, it probably will. That That's one of the biggest things where I feel like uh, in my mock, I'm like, uh, it's probably at some point somebody's going to trade down, <laughs> yeah. somebody's going to move up, and it's going to just disrupt the entire thing. But, you know, I usually just go, you know, with the picks that are given, you know, how it's slated to go pick by pick. And, and um, it's it's difficult to to go, like you said, what you think, who they who you think they should pick and who they're going to pick. Because when you do it, you kind of try to do it with a rational mind of what a GM should do, who they should pick, who fits them best. And it's like. You expect them to make this pick, but then you realize that every general manager isn't the smartest guy in the world or, um, you know, the, the way their draft room works is, you know, some it, it boggles the mind at times. So, you know, it, it, it'll completely throw you off. So the, the way I did mine was I went with uh, who's the best fit, who they should pick. And, you know, if, if, if the GM is at least a rational guy who they will pick and just hope for the best okay and in, in the case of let's say sacramento and memphis who chris wallace and body divots who have not had the best history of picking that could be all entirely different right but i will uh let, let, which, like i said we're just going to do the top 15 picks we're going to go through our picks on that i'm going to have up uh, an article on the popculturecosmos.wordpress.com with my total 15 picks but we're going to start with you my friend We're going to give you the first choice. We're going to say you're going to be the Phoenix GM, the GM for the Phoenix Suns, and you get the first pick. Although that seems to be, of the picks that are out there, that seems to be the one that that pretty much has a consensus on who is going number one. Right. Uh, So with the first pick, Phoenix Suns, uh, they take Aiden. I mean, I think he, he went to Arizona. You know, they need a big. He, he's a guy who looks has the looks of a franchise player. I think there's no way they can pass up on him. That's DeAndre Ayton, seven one center out of Arizona, freshman, uh, I think 19 years old. 
Uh, he has I got a lot of attributes. He is not my top choice. I would have gone with Luka Doncic, but you know, I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of insiders and a lot of draft analysts have thought that Luka Doncic is a better choice at number one, but all of them to a T are saying that Phoenix is going to, is just in love with the size. They need a fit at that center position. Ty, Tyson Chandler and Alex Len haven't done the job. This guy right here, he is very athletic. He's he's very good on the offensive end. Nice jump shot. He's got a, a developing game. Could work harder on the defensive end and could be a better shot blocker than his numbers dictated. But I, I agree with you that across the board, everybody thinks that Phoenix is going to take him number one. So how can I argue with that? He is, like I said, 7-1, still developing, still got a great game going on. And he could be a all-star for years to come. Right. Yeah. Um, with his build, his size, he's got an NBA body plus already. Um, his athleticism, I, I, there's no way they pass up on him at number one. I think he's the, he's the top choice. He, he looks like he is, and, and he's going to be the only name that's pretty much for sure. A count it as far as on our list right now at the mock draft. So I get the pleasure of being, I guess, Vladi Divac and also uh, uh, I guess Chris Wallace uh, at uh, you know Memphis uh, coming up at two and four. So I get the even numbers. Oh joy, oh joy. <laughs> so I'm going to play the role of Vlade Divac. I know I've, I've been hearing a lot of things, uh, and I've done a lot of research on this from videos to podcasts to articles to rumors to Twitter to, to social media to everything right now I've, as far as before I even made my choices as far as how I think the mock draft will go. Sacramento seems to be this wild card of everything to be infatuated with players like Michael Porter Jr. to even thinking about Luka Doncic, uh, but you know, I hear the other rumors the other way that says Vladi's not in love with Luka Doncic. So I think I'm going to throw out there the only name out there that has actually wanted to go ahead and work out for the Kings because a lot of players have passed up working out for the Kings, not given the medicals, which I still kind of find very, I don't know, you should be able always to, if you're a team, get medicals from all the players, potential college players, but that's an issue for a collective bargaining agreement for another day. So I will say this, the only person that has wanted to become a part of the Kings, I think is still going to be a good fit. It's Marvin Bagley, the third uh, from Duke, great offensive player. He's probably going to get you a double-double, uh, possibly even a 2010, pretty much every time out. The only thing is he is very limited defensively. The new switching type format that everybody seems to be trending towards to that Golden State is really popularized as far as on the defensive end. He may not be up to snuff on. He may, he may fall behind in that category so there may be points in times where you might not have to not be able to keep him keep him on the floor but offensively he does have a great rounded game inside and outside and i think that the fact that he wants to be a sacramento king just puts it more into his favor and i think it would be a solid choice i don't think it would be the best choice but I think it, at this point in time, if he truly wants to be a king, I think that speaks volumes to the fan base that's out there. And so I think Marvin Bagley 3 would be my pick for number two. Who do you got for number three, my friend? That's going to be the Atlanta Hawks. They're on the clock right now. You're the GM. So what you got cooking, man? In, uh, for number three. In Hotlanta. In Hotlanta. Hotlanta. I, I think they go with Luka Doncic. I think uh, they're pretty much uh, the Dennis Schroeder era at point guard is kind of over. Um, even if they choose to keep him, I think you can play Doncic at the two. He's big enough. He's tall enough. Um, and I, will say, I will say this. I think he actually, because of his athleticism has been questioned, I think he's a better fit at the three since he's 6'8", since he's tall enough. I think he could go and be that uh, small forward that's a big-time playmaker from that end. I think that's a good choice. Yeah, I, I, I think he they're pretty much from the ground up. So I think they can take any player, and I think they're going to go with uh, best player on the board in their eyes. You know, he may be the best player on the board. Um, he'll be the biggest 
uh, upside guy at that point. Um, I think they take uh, – I, I, I just think they have so many positions that they don't have solidified that he's a guy that they can take. Um, like you said at two, uh, Bagley, I felt the same way. I think they go with Bagley because they have a point guard. They don't need Doncic. They have – positions that you know other players at other positions um and i think atlanta is wide open in their positioning and i think luka Doncic is the pick at three that's an excellent choice in fact the rumors the latest rumors as of this recording are pointing to atlanta uh, atlanta leaning towards uh luka Doncic, and i think that would be a great choice in fact uh, for many people including myself from what i've seen and and what i've listened to and what i've observed he, he looks like to me he's the number one player overall, but uh, you know I know there's questions about his athleticism, and I really think he would actually make, like you said, a, a not only a, a pretty good off guard, but probably even a better small forward and facilitating the offense from that end. Number four, Memphis Grizzlies. Oh, there's been a lot of talk about this one. I don't think they're going to keep their pick. I think they're going to try and get that pick moved. Uh, they have an awful Chandler Parsons contract in which they're trying to move. We've already seen already before this this started that people are trying to get off of bad contracts. Uh, Brooklyn and Charlotte both traded bad contracts, although getting Dwight Howard for a year, getting that expiring deal, that was actually a pretty good move by Brooklyn. I'll give the props on that for Timofey Mozgov. Uh, something that <laughs> the Mitch Kupchak. Reason, I, I don't know if you have something on Mitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. It just if I was with him, if if I was Michael Jordan right now, I'd be like, going. Like, oh, is that why I'm, you got kicked out of Los Angeles in the right, first place? <laughs> right. And I know, I know the Dwight Howard. You know, I know we're on this draft thing, but to me, the Dwight Howard deal. I'd rather have Dwight. At twenty three million for one season, then Timofey Mozgov for thirty two at at two. I agree with you hundred percent. He's actually provided a double double every year in the league, and every still, year. and still will do so. I I honestly think the Dwight Howard thing is is more, um, uh, perception at this point than than what he he's perceived more as a bad player than than what he actually produces on the court. He's actually a, a, a decent player. He doesn't take enough shots to get you the kind of points that people think he should be getting, but he still blocks shots. He still rebounds. He still defensively controls the paint um, well enough to be um, more than a serviceable center. But you know, I just say this: it, it comes down to th- it comes down to three words, my friend: pick and roll. He never learned to live with it. He never learned to deal with it. He never learned to utilize it offensively enough. He never used. He never basically wanted to do it on a defensive end either. And had he just embraced that it on both sides a little bit more, he'd be one of the greatest five centers of all time. Simple as that. But, and and he also uh, the thing with Dwight is he 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 suffers from the transition in in era. When he first came in, they would go to him more. They would go to him more, and then the lead transition to. The bigs don't do much. Um, they exactly like you said. They pick and roll, but other than that, the ball is passed around the perimeter. Everybody shoots threes. Um, so he's kind of you know it's been a detriment to his career where he probably would if he was playing in a different era, get the ball on the block a little bit more, get more shot attempts. Um, but everybody wants to shoot threes, and that's nowhere near his game. So you know he's stuck with fourteen points a game and and, and twelve rebounds. And to that point, it's just look. Everybody, you know, praises Clint Capella for embracing that game, and his stats aren't much better, if at all, more than Dwight Howard's at this point in time. So, and like you said, it's just about perception. But we could go on all day about Dwight Howard, but yeah, right, <laughs> especially as a Lakers fan. But we won't go there. <laughs> but I will say, at number four, again, you you blessing me with all these outstanding organizations here and all this great uh, choices that they've made in the pl- in the past. I will not go Hakeem the beat. Um, I will <laughs> uh, inside joke there for for NBA draft junkies. Uh, I will probably choose at number four, even though he has not provided medicals and he's not exactly thrilled about going there. I'm going to have to go with Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, a little bit above Mohamed Bama, 
Bamba or I could say Mo, Mo Bamba or Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, they're both outstanding at, at that. It's what they do as far as from a defensive end. But I think from the fact that I think Jaron Jackson can play forward right now still, uh, I would probably put him right now as the, as the choice ahead of Mo Bamba. I just think he's a little bit better fit right now for Memphis. The fact that you still have Marcus all there and you don't seem to want to trade him, even though you had the chance and more, you know, you've had the opportunity to do so for quite a while and, you're just now you're pretty much stuck with them. So you got Marcus all there. You might as well get a nice big forward developing that's young. He's on the, the younger side of as far as the uh, players that are eligible for in this draft. So I'm going to go with Jaron Jackson Jr., the 6'11 forward slash center out of Michigan State. And I think he's going to be a, a good quality fit. Whether or not be, he becomes a star, I'm not sure. He does everything well on both sides of the floor, but I don't think he does anything truly outstanding or will develop into something that's truly outstanding. I just think he's going to be a very, very good pro for uh, many years to come. So we got, that leaves you with Dallas, my friend. We're, we're heading to Dallas. We're heading there with the Mavericks. Okay. You've, you're, you've been in consultations with Mark Cuban. So who, my friend, have you got slotted at number five for the Dallas Mavericks? I, I go with uh, Bamba. I think Mo Bamba is their pick. At five, I think they're ready to move on from the uh, New Orleans Noel experiment, and they need a, a, a legitimate center um, that's versatile, um, long, athletic. Uh, I even saw a workout where he showed he he's got a bit of range. Um, he went to Texas, so he you know he's a he's a tech he's a UT guy. Uh, I think he fits perfectly with what they're trying to do. They already have a point guard. They have decent players at other positions and, and, and Harrison Barnes. Uh, so I think they continue to build and, and Mo Bamba is their choice. I will say this. You can never argue with seven foot, 10 inch reach. <laughs> that's just, that's, you know, and to see him athletically. And he, now he's trying to develop his jump shot because he understands where the game is going to, and right. he wants to stay on the floor. He didn't have a great motor at Texas. I know that's one of the things that people talk about. And obviously his offensive games needs to be refined a bit, but he looks like he is working hard on it. He is working out with individuals that that are going to be able to push his game further. So I think that's an excellent pick at number five, Mo Bamba. He could really spearhead that, well, basically that, that entire team for that and just be that anchor. And, and like I said, he could be an offensive Rudy Gobert if he applies himself and actually gets that shot going to where it needs to be. So excellent choice on number five. Number six, the Orlando Magic. Uh, I'll tell you what, all signs would say, hey, we're going to go ahead and, and look towards a point guard or the best point guard in the draft right now. I'm. That's the problem, though. I don't think there is a really outstanding point guard that that really is is going to be able to satisfy the needs of Orlando at this point in time. I think they're going to go in a different direction. I think they're going to go with uh, Wendell Carter uh, out of Duke. Uh, I think they're going to go ahead and and take care, take him because he is going to be uh, in many ways like Jaron Jackson Jr. He is very solid on both ends of the floor. I think he can really solidify things for the future. I'm not in love with the fact that they're going to have to re-sign Aaron Gordon for a gazillion dollars because he's going to be a restricted free agent. I, I really don't think he's going to be worth the money that you're going to sign him to. I think it when you have a player by Wendell Carter Jr., who's pretty much going to be a solid foundational piece for many years to come, I think that's a better option than Trey Young or Colin Sexton or whoever you're thinking about as a potential point guard replacement because of the fact that I think Trey Young and Colin Sexton both have limitations that could prevent them from really being that foundational piece for Orlando going forward. What you got, my uh, what you got next, my friend? We've got number seven. Uh, we've got Chicago Bulls. I know there's some names out there that are very interesting. Like I said, Trey Young, Colin Sexton, but uh, who do you got? You're on the clock, my friend. The okay. former home of Michael Jordan, man, Chicago Bulls. I, I actually had. My in my mock, I had uh Chicago taking one of the players who you've already selected in um Jaron Jackson. Uh that's who I thought would fall to them. Um, I think he fits them because he can play 
uh, 6'11". He can play with uh, uh, Markkinen, and he can also play with uh, Portis. Uh, in I just classes. think there's too much there's too much youth and talent. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's who I had to them. Um, I think he fits what they want to do. Um, they they'll be able to get up and down. They'll be able to you know continue uh, and not have to put any of their young players, like you said, their young talented players on the bench and not give them uh, playing time or hold them back uh, by drafting people too many at the same position. I, I think he's a good fit for them. Uh, seven. Well, but Sharon Jackson's gone, my friend. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's just too much young youth. I think there's too much youth and talent there. So um, he's gone, my friend. He's off the board. So who you got, right. number seven? So who we have left? Uh, Michael Porter Jr. There you go. That he's been he's been widely rumored to end up there. He's, in fact, he's been anywhere from two to ten uh, when it comes down to it. Talent wise, he would probably be, be number two in any other year if he were healthy. But I think that's the problem. He had a serious back issue. He had surgery. He was out virtually the entire college year. Didn't come back until late. He's had issues, health hit issues, I think, with the hip uh, during the workout season here. So that has scared off a lot of teams. And I think it's all about the medicals. If, if he's sending out those medicals and people are able to look at and determine, hey, he's going to be able long-term to be a viable prospect, I think it's going to be a steal for Chicago, but then again, it's a back issue, and that could be an uh, could be a problem long term because we've seen how many players over the course of the years. We'll start with Larry Bird. What kind of uh, career once the back issue started? What that did for him? Yeah, Tracy McGrady too um, was another player once once his back went. Uh, it's, Steve it's, Nash. Yeah, it's, it back is one of the most underrated uh, injuries that that really can curtail a. a a career, you know, uh, back and legs are, are what you need as a player. Um, but I, I think Michael Porter will get the uh, Kyrie Irving benefit of the doubt. You know, he kind of the same thing, not the same injury, but um, as far as what happened in college, only played a few games, got injured. Um, but the upside was such and in, in, in the flash of what they were in the few games that they played um, still entices a GM enough to take them early. Fair enough, fair enough. I think that is a good call there. I think at seven, I think that's a risk you want to take. And like you said, they have Laurie Markin uh, Chris Dunn and Zach Levine. I don't know. That backcourt, when healthy, could be very good. But who knows about the future for that backcourt because if you know, there's injury issues there. There's also motivational issues. Uh, there's a reason why they're both not on Minnesota anymore. So I will say this, that if – all meshes out. Chicago could be a found a really good, really good team going forward if Michael Porter Jr. and that backcourt really gets uh, solidified and and stays healthy and and could be actually a team to be uh, uh, watch out for, team to watch out for in the Eastern Conference. So that's a, definitely a good pick right there. That's a that's a that's number seven. He is definitely a good pick. I, I'll give you that. In fact, that's a that's on my mock board as well. Number eight, I'm going to take uh, at you know going to be the Cleveland Cavaliers. We all know what's going on with LeBron. We we don't know if he's going to stay there. Most likely, he's not. Obviously, he has his eyes on many places at this point in time. I think at this point in time, I'm going to go ahead and say that Mikhail Bridges, uh, Jr. from Villanova, it's the first. Uh, I don't want to say not young guy because they're all young guys, but the mm -hmm. first non freshman. Uh, outside of Luka Doncic to really go in this draft. I think he's he's really proven himself with, you know, obviously with Villanova doing very well in the NCAA tournaments uh, in recent times. A lot has to do with him. I think uh, Mikhail Bridges is going to be that solid two-way player, the 3 and D type wing that the NBA is trending towards. I think he is going to be a good, solid pro. And I think for that, if you're going to lose LeBron, you better start somewhere. And they say they're not going to blow it up, but I think they do need to blow it up. But if they're not going to blow it up in Cleveland, then let's just go with a foul, a, a really good solid, solid foundational piece in Mikhail Bridges. So I think next on the clock would be, <laughs> you get all the good ones, my friend. Yeah. It's going to be the, the New York Knicks. 
New York Knicks, there's still a lot of great players on the board, my friend. Who do you got at number nine for the New York Knicks? Trey, if Trey Young is on the board, there's no way he gets past New York. Um, I just for name only, just for namesake only, because you know they love to make a splash in New York. Yeah, um, he he's gonna sell tickets. He'll fill up the he'll fill up the stadium. Um, what they think, and, and if he can be close to the player that he was in college, and and he's not gonna be that at least not early on. Uh, what he was able to do for the most part in college, but you put that with a, um, you know, Kristaps uh, Porzingis, and you start to build something. Kristaps, uh, I think is, uh, I think he's going to be out for a while. Um, he won't. I don't think he'll be ready for the start of the season. Uh, sometime no, probably, probably, probably around the beginning of twenty nineteen. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, so this gives you a guy that people want to come see. Uh, it gives you a guy that that brings you offense and excitement, and that can sell tickets until you know your your, your star player gets back. Uh, but with the lore of of what he was in college, I think I don't think he gets past New York. It's it's a name, and and you know at NYC, it's all about the names, all about the uh, the showtime and all that. I agree with you. I think that's where he's going to end up if he drops at all in the draft. Uh, the only thing is his defense. He, defensively, he is a liability. His size, uh, you know, people try to compare him to Steph Curry. He's not Steph Curry. He's not as big. He's not as tall. Uh, we don't know how good is his shot going to be able to translate his offensive game to the NBA. Uh, so he is going to be a major liability. And we, we actually seen it with Isaiah Thomas. So, you know, when he moved over to the Lakers and even when he was with Cleveland and Boston on the defensive end, his offensive limit, his offensive brilliance was, you know, almost, you know, uh, negated because of the, severe limited liability that he has on the defensive end. So we may be seeing that with Trey Young. Not sure yet, but it looks to, it, it appears to be in that type of situation. But how much offense can he provide? Can he can he be able to facilitate that offense? And when Kristaps Porzingis comes back, is he going to be able to to get him the ball? Because Kristaps, uh, I'll tell you what, he's been a great player for them. It, it's just he the future should be built around him as long as he wants to be there in New York. I think he's going to be a tremendous asset going forward. And and uh, Trey Young, I think, like you said, they need to be splashy in NYC. And I think this is going to be able to to fill that mix for them. Number ten, number ten, my friend, uh, is going to be uh, Philadelphia 76ers. And I'm going to go ahead and you know I think at this point in time the Sixers do need some things, but they don't need a whole lot. Obviously, right. they're on the cusp of greatness. I think that at this point in time, you got to go with a lot of potential. And Kevin Knox, to me, is a lot of potential being one of the youngest players in the draft, but also one of the most skilled, especially with a, a very, very good jump shot. And also, as well, a developing game, 6'9", can hit the jumper, can really become that stretch four that I think both Joel Embiid and uh, obviously, Ben Simmons, and even to a lesser extent, Markel Fultz, if he's able to stay on the team and they don't trade him, they, that could really be a cornerstone for a great starting five along with Robert Covington and whatnot that could really pose a problem to a lot of teams in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Uh, what we got next is number 11, my friend. So 11, we've got... Charlotte Hornets again, Mitch Kupchak. We <laughs> always right. coming back to Mitch Kupchak, my friend, and the Charlotte Hornets. Um, you've got Kemba Walker and not a whole lot else. So right. you're in the middle of the war room with uh, with MJ, my friend. Who are you going to pick at number eleven with the Charlotte Hornets? Man, um. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, with Kemba Walker, I will tell you that it's extremely talented. But he it will most likely be moved at some point in time, whether it's during the trade, during the draft, or whether it's uh, sometime during the summer or before the the trade deadline appears in February. I think at some point in time he is going to be moved because he is too valuable commodity, and and plus also as well he probably wants to go out of that losing situation at Charlotte. So who do you got, my friend? Um, I have Miles Bridges. Um, I think the the experiment with most of the players on that team is over. Uh, they got rid of Dwight, like you said. I think I think Kimba will be gone. 
Uh, the Michael Kidd Gilcrest thing has to be over by now. Um, so I, I think a young wing player uh, with some talent, with some upside, uh, is, is where they'll go. And uh, Miles Bridges, to me, is probably the best left on the board. Excellent choice on there. Miles Bridges, uh, definitely going to be a good, solid pro, in my opinion, as well. Uh, he's proven at Michigan State that he could be able to handle the ball well. Uh, pretty good shooter out there. I think at the the number – well, actually, you know what? You know, your team, man, it's your team. It's time for your team. It's, it's coming up right now. Back-to-back, -back, it's the L.A. Clippers. Uh, there's still a lot of talent out there. I think at number 12, they're going to go for a guard, and I think the best guard on there, uh, on the board at this point in time, is Colin Sexton, a uh, freshman out of Alabama. I think he is a very uh, solid point guard in the making, just really just aggressive on both ends of the four. Um, he may not be the greatest shooter in the world, but his aggressiveness and his playmaking ability could make up for that. I think he's going to be a solid choice at number 12 for the LA Clippers. But they have another choice at number 13, my friend. And I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion about exactly who they want at number 13. I, I see one name keep popping up there. I won't say who it is. But if you're uh, still in that war room with Doc Rivers and, and uh, Steve Ballmer and all that, who you got at number 13 with the L.A. Clippers? Um, I've seen a few things looking back and forth. I've seen um, Lonnie Walker. I've seen uh shy gilgis uh alexander uh and that's who i think they'll go with i think gilgis alexander um would be the pick at 13. that was actually my pick on my mock board at number 12. i think they were going to take robert williams if they had the choice but um when miles bridges got moved up i think that sort of moved our draft board in a different direction but uh, i think that's a good choice because like i said I, he was on my uh draft board for for the clippers to pick as well so uh pick number 12 and 13 are down number 14 is coming up next for the denver nuggets um i'm gonna probably at this point in time say that they they're a good team on the cusp of the playoffs they just missed out on the last day so obviously they're they're a winning organization uh they got to deal with something as far as their center situation is concerned because uh nikola Jokic uh is going to be a free agent uh, I believe restricted, I think, or, or whatnot. Uh, he's going to be a, a, he's going to, he's in due for a big paycheck. Let's put it that way. So you got Will Barton, who's been a very productive player for them as well in that mix. Uh, so it's, it's kind of tough to say who they're going to pick on that. But I, if there's anybody that I think that they're going to pick at that, I think I would probably at this point in time, go with Zaire Smith, uh, freshman out of Texas tech. Um, size wise, he's a little undersized, but he has got tremendous athleticism, uh, a developing jump shot and defensively, he is extremely talented on that end of the court. So I think it for number 14, I'm going to go ahead with Zaire Smith out of Texas tech, which leads into our 15th and final pick on our mock draft. What we got going on here today, my friend, it is going to be the Washington wizards. So who you got going on, man, with the uh, Washington Wizards and a very talented team in its first three, four players. Then after that, it's pretty much a mishmash, which is the reason why I don't think they've been able to progress as much as that they wanted to. They've never really dressed their depth as, as well as they should have. So I ask you now, my friend, let's fill out some of that roster with some talent. And it starts with the 15th pick for Washington. Who you got? Uh, I think Washington goes with uh, Robert Williams out of Texas A&M. Uh, I think they need to replace big men. I think they've got enough players on the wing and at the point and, and at the guard positions. Um, they're, they've been trying to kind of get rid, get away from Martin Gortat. Um, and so they need, they're going to need another big. And I think that's the pick at 15. I think that's a good choice. That's that's pretty much around where the time for the around the frame that that he's going in, uh, starting with right around the the Clippers picks and, and whatnot. So you're getting a very talented individual, an individual who emulates in many ways another Texas A&M product uh, in DeAndre Jordan, uh, as far as a rim runner, a defender. 
somebody who really could be that Clint Capella type of, of individual player if he's given a chance. So I could see that happening and, and working with Wall and Beal and, and Otto Porter Jr. on that. that could make out for a good run at Washington. Well, those are our uh, 15 picks in the mock draft. Uh, and I want to ask you this. If there's anyone else that's left on the draft board that could sneak into any one of those top 15 spots, is there a player that sticks out to you? Because I will go myself with Mitchell Robinson. Really, just there's no – he's had some issues with Western Kentucky. didn't really get a chance to play there, whatnot. But he was a highly touted individual in high school – you can't argue with seven one seven four wingspan. Right. From what I hear and what I've seen in the brief videos that there is out there, really talented individual. And if anybody's going to rise up on the charts at this point in time into that back half of the top fifteen, it's going to be Mitchell Robinson, in my opinion. I wish he'll be there for the Lakers, but I don't think he will be. Who you got, my friend? As far as one name that might sneak into that top fifteen. Um. DiVincenzo, I think. Um, Dante DiVincenzo, excellent, excellent, excellent choice. Yeah, I think his, I think his run in in the in the uh, in the tournament. Um, I think a lot of GMs will think that's somebody they can use. Um, I don't know if I would allow that run if I was a GM to like to um, convince me to select him that high. But that well, happens almost every time where right. someone has a great run in the NCAA tournament and seems to enamor themselves to GMs and gets higher, picked higher a lot of times more often than they should. Right. Um, and I think that could be the case here. I think somebody could select him I, anywhere outside of uh, 12, like 12 down, 11 down. I think he, he could somehow, you know, nudge his way in there if, if you know the right gm thinks this is a guy that we can really use um i think he might be able to get in there i think that's some an excellent choice i agree with you on that but like like i said if people seem to get enamored with performances during the ncaa tournament too much i think they rely on it but they think when the pressure's on like that and somebody performs it hey they're going to do it at the nba level and that always that doesn't always translate it doesn't always is it's not always the case but you know what at that point in time you're you're to me a beyond pick 10 i think it's a free for all and i think if somebody's really enamored with him they might actually take him so that's a, that's an excellent thought on that once again i have my, once again i have my good friend anthony barbarin right here our nba expert and man in the know for us here at inside sports and pop culture cosmos one thing i wanted to talk about to you before we head on out my friend is free agency is around the corner. It's in a way, it's already almost begun with the decisions that have been made in you know that are going to be made in San Antonio by one Kawhi Leonard actually wanting to leave San, San Antonio. Although him and uh, Greg Popovich have had recent talks here in California, in California, um, you know near where you're at, my friend in regards to hopefully trying to patch things up or seeing exactly where Kawhi's head is at. It looks like still that Kawhi wants out of San Antonio. He's, he's probably going to be, he's asked for a trade to the Lakers or the Clippers, preferably the Lakers. I'm sorry, man, but he said LA. Okay. But we all know what that meant uh, as far as, uh, you know, what, what that's concerned. But that might dictate a lot of things when it comes to free agency, including the possible rival to LeBron and Paul George. I don't think it's going to happen, personally, that all three of them are going to be end up on the team. I think Boston and Philadelphia has a little bit better assets than the Lakers to move for a Kawhi Leonard. Plus, I don't think Greg Popovich just doesn't really want to help the Lakers in any way, shape, or form. But that leads us into free agency with a lot of movement that's expected and start off with LeBron James. So I'm going to hit it right at you, my friend. LeBron James is an unrestricted re free agent come July 1. Where does he end up come July 10th? Is he going to be uh, back on Cleveland or is he going to head somewhere else? There's been rumor and speculation, Boston, LA, both LA teams, Houston, Portland, just it's out there, man. Where do you think, LeBron James is going to end up this time, say July 10th, when he finally makes another announcement or a decision. I should decision. say. 
I actually think this will be unlike his other two free agency years. Um, I kind of see him letting things play out a little bit, whereas he's been the the the, the piece um, that falls first and everybody else goes after that. I think this will be a time where he lets some other pieces fall, um, a la Paul George, um, maybe the Kawhi trade, because – I know a lot of people have him moving into this stage of his career where he's setting up the rest of everything. Um, you know, you know, being a brand, you know, a uh, business acumen, that thing. But I, I think his, in his mind, I think he's still in championship mode. I think he still wants to win championships and compete as a, at a high level. And so for him, I think um, it's, it's about what's going to play out. And I, I see him it, it going to a number of places. Um, possibility uh you keep hearing the lakers i think that's a possibility um the clippers a possibility um staying in cleveland is a possibility houston i hear but i don't really see him going to houston um for the simple fact of the way they play basketball he wants to move off the ball but playing in in and that system off the ball is literally standing, waiting for someone to pass it to you. And I don't think that's the kind of game he wants to play. Um, dark horse candidate, New Orleans, um, playing with Anthony Davis, uh, maybe a sign and trade with, with, with DeMarcus Cousins, um, and stay, even staying in the Eastern Conference. I mean, there to me, there's so it's so wide open with him. Uh I I, I I don't even think he knows where he wants to go yet, which is why I said. Uh, in this instance, he'll wait and, and see how things play out. Um, so because of that, there's not a, a, a clear cut place. So I'm just going to say the Clippers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? You know, hope, hope. Uh, I actually think if he could get another player to go with him, um, that's the best fit for him uh, because of the roster was already on the roster. I think they 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 arguably are ready to compete now. Um, if there's a, a, say, a Paul George, if he and Paul George got together and say, we're going to go somewhere and play, uh, the roster that would be there uh, is the best roster for him as far as they they slot in at the two and the three with Tobias Harris, with DeAndre Jordan, with uh, Patrick Beverly and Lou Williams off the bench. I think that's that's a great fit. But there's, there's no telling where he's going to go. Well, at this point, I, I... – I say that's not too far fetched, my friend. The only thing is that beloved cap space. You mentioned the um, the New Orleans Hornets. Uh, sorry, yeah, the, the New Orleans Pelicans. I'm sorry. See, it's got me still talking to Hornets. The New Orleans Pelicans uh, in the mix. That well, remember, uh, Demarcus Cousins is an unrestricted free agent, so they would have to. He would have to agree to terms if he were to be traded in a sign and trade with. Uh, LeBron, they would both be doing a sign and trade uh, right. with Cleveland on that. And I'm not sure if I was Cleveland, I would want to take back somebody with a, uh, you know, working off of a torn Achilles tendon. Uh, that that would be an issue with me. I'm just going to be honest with you on that. Um, I wouldn't be love with it. I'm not exactly in love with the fact that you know any Demarcus Cousins rumors to Lakers. Uh, just the fact that again, this is a player that has an Achilles tor- a torn Achilles tendon. And it is very tough to come back, especially thinking that, okay, he's a seven foot, 280, 300 pounder. So no matter how talented you are, you're never going to come back as the same player. It's never been proven yet that you can come back as the same player. I mean, Kobe Bryant, Wesley Matthews has not been the same player. He's, he's, he's still a very solid player but he's never been the same player that he once was before the injury. And there's, there's a list of others as well. So, I want to ask you this. Uh, I will say, uh, well, I will say this. The When it comes to LeBron James, do I think he's going to go to the Lakers? That's a possibility. He does have a home in LA. Uh, they do have the max amount, maximum amount of cap space. They, he could get him and Paul George there. I don't think you're going to get all three with him and Kawhi Leonard, but I really think that's a possibility, both him and Paul George, if he's willing to accept the team that's around him. The team that's around him is not bad. It's a 35-win team. So with 
with them, they could be, you know, you gain another 15, 20 games out of it. So I could say they can compete with the Western Conference. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be as good as the Golden State Warriors. I don't think at this point in time you could say they will be. But, you know, I think that's a good start as far as cap space. If uh, it was to the point where he just didn't care about money at all and just cared about winning, he would probably go to Houston. I think that would probably be the best fit for him there. I think they have the opportunity to go ahead and sign him there if they wanted to. I think both ways it, it could work if Chris Paul and him worked out you know, some type of monetarily, some type of discount for both of them. But we've heard from Chris Paul, he doesn't want to take a discount. So right. it, it's not going to work there either. So where else? Uh, Boston. Boston, you know, they've got money. They've got assets to move. But the problem is they've got a ton of forwards. Right. And, uh, you know, where does that leave LeBron? Uh, so LeBron plays there. He's going to take up the bulk of minutes. What does that do to Brown, Tatum, uh, Hayward, and and a whole nine yards? Horford even, you know, what, what do you do with that as far as all those different similar-sized athletes that you've got there? Yeah. At this point in time, it's tough. But I, I think the Lakers, and I don't mean this because just because I'm a Lakers fan and I would be happy to see him there, I just think logistically, from what it works out at this point in time, he either stays in Cleveland or goes to L.A. at this point in time. Um, I want to ask you this, uh, touching on other free agency issues. There is also Paul George, who, who was, you know, said he wanted to be in Los Angeles, so that could be a given there, unless he wants to go back to Oklahoma City, although that didn't work out as well as they had hoped. Name me another free agent that you think is going to generate a lot of interest during this off season. And where do you think that individual could go? Because I've got one in mind as well. Um, I, with the Paul George thing, I, I've been hearing a lot about him staying in OKC. Um, I think he liked playing with another superstar. Um, I think that aspect appealed to him because he spent so many years um, in Indiana playing by himself, being the only superstar. He, he and Danny Granger kind of didn't overlap where they were both at the peak of their games. Um, so being able to play and not have the entire load on him, I think is something that appeals to him. Um, the other player uh, that could really change, not necessarily change things, but uh, there'll be interesting. I think one is, 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 There's there's two. Like you said, there's um Demarcus Cousins. And just because of how impactful he can be, um, I think a smaller team, a team that has nothing right now, will take that chance. Um I'm also hearing, you know, DeAndre Jordan wants out. And he wants to, from rumors, he he wants to go to Houston. Um, so I think that can be something that that can really change uh, the way the the game is played. They would have to move off of Clint Capella, uh, but um, that's another name I think could uh, could end up in the free agent market. Well, that's, that's the thing with me. I, I think Clint Capella plays the uh, the role almost as well as a DeAndre Jordan could, probably better because he's a better free throw shooter. And he comes, even if they're, they're both, you know, get re-signed to deals and comparatively speaking, I think DeAndre Jordan is an older, more expensive version of Clint Capella that shoots worse at free throws. Yeah, I, I could kind of concur with that. Um, yeah, De it, it. I think it all hinges on what Clint Capella asks for because right now DeAndre Jordan's getting um, – had over 20 million 23 yeah. something out there um but i can actually see clint capella uh commanding somewhere around there 18 19 um in that range it kind of reminds me of uh deandre jordan's initial burst on the scene and golden state offered him you know a deal as an as an um as a restricted free agent uh that caused the clippers to have to overpay for him at that time um, I can see I can see the same type of thing happening with Clint Capella, um, but it also goes to keeping your stars. Uh, you know, Chris Paul, who I, I think is, is no brainer, he resigns with Houston. Uh, 
might want DeAndre. They, you know, they repaired their relationships the last, you know, year with the Clippers. And I can see that, you know, if he wants that guy in there, that that's something they could do to appease him. I'm probably going to say if there's any other free agents that's going to affect the marketplace, I think De DeMarcus Cousins, even with his injury, will affect the marketplace. I think there's there's one individual out there that might uh, change teams and actually uh, get the interest uh, going for that franchise. Could be Julius Randle. I think he uh, had a greatly improved year last year. I think the Lakers will regret not uh, picking up that last year of his contract. And now that he's on a restricted status, I don't think if the Lakers uh, are confronted with a large offer for him, which I think he will get, because I think there's some teams out there that will pay for his services, 15 to 17 million. I don't think the Lakers will match it. Uh, they could do it in a sign and trade as far as match it and then try to send it to him to get some assets back on the deal because they have so much cap space right now. But, I don't see him long term if he asks for and gets over 15 to 17 million a year, him being something that the Lakers, even though they're very happy with what he did, are, are still going to be able to uh, retain him long term because they have, uh, for lack of a better term, bigger fish to fry when it comes to right. LeBron James and Paul George and Kawhi and all that. So I, I think that he's going to be a casualty of the situation for Lakers fans out there. I don't think he will be staying on the team, although uh, he, you know he's he has his limitations, but he is definitely a someone that can be an asset for your team. Uh, I think he's going to be. I think Dallas. I think is is a good opportunity for him because he's from the Texas area. Uh, I think any other team with cap space out there that is interested in a very solid power forward uh, is going to look into his services. And, and definitely uh, look into getting him at a rate that's reasonable. Now, if it does, the, the, if the bidding war goes to 15 to 17 million, like I said, not only is it going to price out a lot of other teams, but it's going to price out the Lakers as well. But I think he's someone that can move the needle. Doesn't move it greatly, but it sends that, that franchise in a positive direction because he, he is a good player, uh, still very young at 23, and, and definitely has his whole future ahead of him. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, uh, and I've thought this for a while, is that Dallas will go after him. I think Dallas will get him early, uh, which will negate the Lakers being able to resign him. Even if everything else falters, they can't they can't go in on Julius Randle and and still be in a position to go after who they're trying to go after. Um, but I think he'll get a big contract uh, from from Dallas, and he'll end up there. Uh, another guy is is that I think will get a bigger contract and, and will end up on another team is Aaron Gordon. I think he'll get around that same amount, eighteen million. Uh, I could even see somebody giving him, you know, twenty a year. Yeah, but I don't think Orlando is going to uh, match that. I think they'll let him walk. Uh, I would, I would. I'm going to say right now, I would. I don't uh, think he's worth that. I think he's a decent player, a streaky shooter, very athletic who doesn't do enough for you on the defensive end. I agree on the defensive end. I think offensive – I think he also suffers from playing in Orlando. I mean, most people do. Um, <laughs> I put him on a better team with a better coach. Better you you say that's like a bad thing. Okay, I'm spending too much time at Disney <laughs> World, man. Uh, you know, I'm just you know, not, not concentrating on the floor. They actually were in the finals in the century at one point in time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> but you see him with a with a coach that somebody like, um, which they probably won't get. I'm just throwing somebody San Antonio, uh, somebody who a coach that can get the best out of him and and use him the way he needs to be used. I I think he he can be uh, a legitimate, uh, you know, player a rot not not a rotational guy, but a legitimate foundational player on your team. Um, but you know, I, I don't think Orlando's good enough. And they've made the proper moves in personnel, uh, at players or coaches or, you know, office up in management to 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 handicap themselves by getting them. They are in the in the, in the mode where they got to find a franchise guy somehow. And um, I don't think Aaron Gordon is 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 the guy they want to uh, attempt to, to make that guy. 
you got to ask yourself, do you want to plug up a, a good chunk of your salary cap to this guy if you're Orlando? And if I was running Orlando, I would say no. Right. He's a great player, a complimentary piece at 10 to 12 million, but at 20, uh, 2022, even at 15 to 17, I, I, I don't know. I just don't think he, you know, you've already got enough bad contracts there. And I ended, I would, could very see, I could very much see that happening as far as him teetering on a bad contract than a good one. But uh, like, like I said, that's that somebody's going to be able to be enamored enough with them that they're going to sign him to a big contract and dare Orlando right into, yeah, matching it exactly. So that's that's a very, very, very uh, uh, excellent suggestion on that. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly 100% on Aaron Gordon. There's well, a, my friend. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Let me throw one more name out there. Let me throw one more name out there. Jabari Parker. He's coming off the two ACLs. Um, yeah, Jabari Parker, exactly. I can see somebody not giving – he's not going to make a lot of money because of the injury history, um, but I can see him signing a smaller deal, going to another team, because um, I don't think he liked the way he was used when he did come back. And if he can stay healthy, um, becoming who you know he was drafted to be. But that's a big risk. Like like you said, two ACL injuries. That's a that's a tough deal. But if anyone can do it, we've seen players with with uh, extensive knee injuries still perform well at a certain level. And you're right, Jabari Parker has a game that translates to a very good offensively, uh, a very good offensive level. Um, he's got that. I don't want to say Carmelo type deal, but he's got a game that's very sly, that's very slick, that that will age well in the nba and if he does embrace a role on a contender as a supporting cast member he could be a valuable asset but if he wants to go ahead and become a star and a 20 point score in this league i don't think those days after the injuries might be behind him but you're right he might go just chase the money or chase chase a losing team in a situation where he just becomes the top scorer on a losing team and that that may not be the best thing for him. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that one. But yeah, that, that's a, a, another excellent choice on Jabari Parker. But free agency is going to be definitely uh, very interesting to see. Uh, I'm also very excited for the NBA draft as well. We're, we're going to be you know, getting all this info. And to me, this is the funnest time of the NBA year. We've got summer league, the draft, and free agency all in just one time frame. And it's just as an NBA fan and NBA junkie like you, you and I, we're just we're just eating this all up at this point in time. And I can't wait for all this action and this flurry of moves, starting with the Dwight Howard trade. Uh, that's already looks like it's going to be going down. That uh, can't wait to uh, it to start to unfold. And and the action starts tomorrow night with the NBA draft and going forward as of July first for free agency. Anthony, it's been so great uh, taking the time to be on the show. Obviously going to have you on when we start talking about the future for the NBA and, and the results maybe of what happens uh, with, with the free agent market and then uh, what's going ahead for all of our teams here in the NBA. Just uh, cannot wait to have you back on talking some more round ball with you, my friend. Oh, I love, always love coming on. Can't wait to be on again. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, what unfolds uh, uh, after this moratorium and, uh, you know, see what uh the nba has in store for next season as long as mitch kupchak isn't running one of our teams <laughs> absolutely absolutely anthony it's always great talking the nba with you my friend always great doing it for inside sports and of course right here on the pop culture cosmos